Good evening. Hi, Mark. How are you? Doing all right, Stan Warm. How about yourself? Yeah, well, I'm relegated to the basement, so hopefully I stay warm, but <laughs> it's cold tonight. Yes, it is. It's uh, going to get even colder. Yeah. Which is... From, from March 22nd, I think I only remember one other time or a couple other times it was this cold in mid to late March. Yeah. So I have made you the co-host so that you can share. Okay. Share the screen. My camera working? Not that I can. Uh, there you there go. There it goes. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Okay, good. I'm like, turn this off. My lighting down here is not the best. Not bad. Looks uh, comfortable. Okay. You your basement office looks comfortable. Well, looking at National Weather Service, it doesn't look like things are improving. I don't know if you can even see that. <laughs> wow. It's it's looking a little grim out there. There's a, even even the mountains around LA are getting snow. My brother lives in Palm Springs and San Juancito Mountain top has got snow and along the Pacific Coast mountain ways they've gotten snow too. So it's just crazy. Yeah, pretty widespread. Yep. <clears throat> I'll, I'll take snow over freezing rain. Yep, I agree.
So Mark, uh, again, I've set you up as co-host so that we can share, share the screen. And if you want to get your PowerPoint program up and running. Okay. Okay, I think it's ready whenever you want me to share. Yep, go ahead. How do you want to do uh, questions? So do you know how to work the chat box? Yeah, I think so. Okay. What I found works easier is that the speaker, as you get questions coming in through chat, it's easier for you to grab a hold of it and work it. Because otherwise I'm interrupting you constantly. Okay. Interrupting you occasionally. All right, we can do it that way. Well, good evening, everybody. I've got six o'clock on my iPad. <laughs> I stopped wearing a watch a while ago. So welcome to the tree program. And this is taught by Mark Ellison, who is the city of Cheyenne forester. And he's also been a state forester. So he knows a lot about forest management from both the, the wilderness perspective and the urban perspective. He takes care of the trees in Cheyenne and the public right of ways and the parks and at least it's a huge task and he's got a great crew and mark and i've worked together off and on for a whole bunch of years and some of those times was on the emerald ash borer, which is still not here and we hope it never shows up we have enough problems with our ash trees they certainly don't need more issues so with that i'm going to turn the program over to mark and he can give you a little more information on himself and he will take us on a great lecture series with uh, how to take care of trees. So Mark, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Catherine. Um, if you guys are having any problem hearing me, I guess, let me know in the chat box. Uh, the furnace is working pretty hard tonight, so that's probably the buzz <laughs> you might be hearing. But, um, <laughs> So far, it's keeping us warm, so that's a good thing. Uh, so as Catherine mentioned, I'm the city forester here in Cheyenne. Um, I've been the city forester for about five, six years now. Um, before that, I worked for the Wyoming State Forestry Division in Cheyenne and in Riverton. 
And then before that, I worked for several other forestry and natural resources organizations, um, the Minnesota DNR, the Colorado State Forest Service, um, the cities of Longmont and Fort Collins, and the U.S. Forest Service. So got about 30 years of experience in forestry now. I know I don't look that old, but uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a good 30 years. It's it's a good profession. Definitely. I would recommend it if you have any uh, kids interested in in uh, a career that'll largely be outdoors and, and mostly rewarding. Um, I would definitely encourage them into forestry or urban forestry, arboriculture, that sort of thing. So I've got like 80 some slides for you tonight. I know we got three hours. I think I've got it in three sections. So um, we'll take some breaks between uh, each section. Um, I'll try to keep up on the chat box. If you have questions as I'm going along, just put them in the chat box and I'll try to answer them fairly quickly. Um, so let's get started. First uh, question for both for the for the group. What are these two tree species that are on this first slide? Put them in the chat box if you know. Two of my favorite here in Cheyenne. Let's see. Okay. So a little bit about the Cheyenne Urban Forestry Division. That's the city forestry division here in Cheyenne. Um, we take care of all the trees on city property, which is around 15, 16,000 trees. So that includes parks, greenways, cemeteries, golf courses, um, city buildings, that sort of thing. Got the first answer in the chat box. Cottonwood is one of them. You've got the one on the left correct. Now you need the one on the right. Uh, we do have a website, CheyenneTrees.com. It's not very good. I apologize for that. The, the city um, struggles with uh, outreach, especially uh, as far as our website goes, but uh, it, there's some decent information on there. Um, been a tree city for 40 years. We're the oldest tree city in the state. Um, so that's pretty cool. We'll be having an Arbor Day this year in April at uh, Holiday Park. You all are interested. We have a tree inventory program. So all of our city owned trees are in a GIS based inventory program called Tree Plotter. It's a great tool for us to manage trees. Um, helps me to gauge where we're going to send our crews. Um, it helps me manage pruning rotations, um, helps me manage tree planting projects and a lot of other things. I can query tree species and it'll tell me how many trees we have of a certain species. Um, I can run a lot of um, graphs and that sort of thing. So it's, it's really a, a great program. Got a couple more answers in the chat box. However, both are incorrect, so keep guessing. Uh, we also manage the High Plains Arboretum. Hopefully all of you have been out there, but it's west of town and it's a really cool um, site. It was established in the 1920s and it was a, a horticulture research station where the USDA trialed plants from around the world to see if they would grow in Cheyenne. I think their uh, thought was if it can grow in Cheyenne, it can grow about anywhere in the United States. And so the, the toughest trees and plants were trialed here. And uh, the, uh, the research switched in the 1970s from horticulture to rangeland management. And then at that time, um, they passed the Arboretum off to um, the city and uh, we've been taking care of it for um, quite a while now, but uh, there's a greenhouse out there. There's a lath house um, and we've got some big plans. We're hoping to get some grants in the near future. So um, we recently got a grant from Microsoft. So there's some informational signs out there. There's a kiosk, 
So if you haven't been out there, I'd encourage you to check it out. Oh, uh, man, you still still haven't got that right yet. Come on. Let's go, people. Uh, let's see. Uh, the tree house. Cool tree house next to my office in Lions Park. Uh, we have a tree walk in Lions Park, too. Uh, we have signs identifying about 30-some trees that do well in Cheyenne. So if you have some time, I wouldn't recommend it tomorrow, but on a nice day when the trees are leafed out, um, it's a great tool to kind of see what trees do well in Cheyenne if, if you're thinking about planting some trees in your yard. Tree Toberfest, that's an event that we do with children. And then we've been doing a green industry workshop the past couple of years. Any other guesses on that second tree? Or am I gonna have to give it away to you? I'm, I'm gonna give you a couple more minutes. I have confidence in you. All right, come on. Okay, rooted in Cheyenne. I hope most of you have heard about Rooted in Cheyenne, but it's a neighborhood nonprofit that the City Forestry Division partners with. Oak, hey, somebody got it. It is an oak. It's a bur oak. So good job. Congratulations. If I were, if we we're in person, you would have won a prize, t-shirt or sticker or something. Uh, where was I? Okay, so this is a street tree planting program. Trees cost $50 per tree. And volunteers come out and plant the tree along the street or sidewalk. Uh, the homeowner gets to choose from about eight or 10 tree varieties. Um, we also have no cost trees for those who qualify financially. We've got three target neighborhoods this spring where you can get free trees. So if you live in the Nation Way neighborhood, the Holiday Park neighborhood, or the South Side neighborhood, you can get up to two free trees. Our applications open online at rootedinshyan.com on March 1st. Typically do two planting events a year. Um, this year we're actually doing three, however. We rely heavily on volunteers. So if you haven't planted with us, it's a great opportunity to learn from some of the some of our staff at Urban Forestry and also some uh, green industry professionals from around our community. We get a lot of landscapers and arborists that come and help us plant. And um, they would be your crew leaders. So they take you out, um, you volunteer for about four hours and you get to plant around 10 to 12 trees. We also are gonna have some homeowner workshops this spring. And then this summer, we're hoping to kick off a tree steward program. So this is a program for volunteers um, to learn more about basic tree care, to help us educate homeowners who have received trees, to help us also better engage other nonprofits, other organizations within our, within our community. So I would love it if you guys would volunteer for that program. You have a, a strong background already being um, fledgling master gardeners. So um, if you're interested, there'll be more information on that very soon. I've also got a, got a Facebook page as well. Oh, sorry. Okay, so if you've, if, uh, if you've lived in Cheyenne very long, you know it's a very hard place to grow trees. Um, it's probably the hardest place that I've lived to grow trees. Um, so trees, of course, don't grow naturally here. Um, we're on the high plains, right? Trees that grow native in this area grow in riparian areas. So along creeks, around lakes, that sort of thing. So all the trees, that you, most of the trees you see in Cheyenne have been planted. What are some of our challenges, right? We got a lot of challenges. Uh, don't get a lot of precipitation. You get 12 to 14 inches of precipitation a year. And really, there aren't any trees that can survive on that, except maybe Rocky Mountain Juniper, maybe Ponderosa Pine. So all of our trees that we plant need supplemental moisture. So they need help from you. Hardiness, so cold hardiness. Um, you wanna make sure that you plant a tree that is cold hardy to our climate. So we are a zone four or less. You might get away with a zone five tree um, if you plant it in a 
um, protected site, but mainly I would stick to stick to zone fours and below. Our pH, of course, is pretty darn high, very alkaline. We have clay salts, um, issues with salt, compaction. Um, we've had some crazy storms, you know, as, as our climate changes. What a lot of researchers are finding is that we have um, drastic temperature swings nowadays that we didn't really have in the past. In the past 20 years, we've seen you know, in the fall and spring when our trees are transitioning either to dormancy or um, out of dormancy, we get temperature fluctuations. You know, we go from uh, 50 degrees one day to negative 10 the next, and, and that is really hard on trees or, or vice versa. We might go from cold to, to warm as well. So it does take, take a toll on trees. Insect and disease, um, we always have insect and disease problems. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those coming up. And then people, right? It's hard to train people as, as if you're a parent, you know very well, right? It's hard to get people to care for trees properly, especially when they come from another um, community. You know, I grew up in Wisconsin where you don't necessarily have to do a lot of watering of trees, right? Mother nature takes care of them. so. That's not the case here. We, we have to water those trees. All right, I'm going to check the chat box here. Someone said Russian olive. Yes, Russian olive is a nasty tree that will grow in uh, very low moisture areas, but it is on the state noxious weed list, so you can't plant it. Um, you do see it um, growing in a lot of our riparian areas. Um, it's a prolific cedar, and so birds tend to spread the seeds. And uh, yeah, we've been fighting Russian olive in our riparian areas in Cheyenne for, for quite a while. Luckily, our, our elevation kind of keeps it in check. If, if you go to Colorado or a lower elevation community, um, you, Russian olive seems to take, take hold uh, more so. All right. Let's, let's see, I'm looking at the chat box here. Rainier cherry, inside of the house, out of the wind. That's good to hear. I always like to hear success stories on zone fives or above. Goats are the answer to Russian olive, yes. Very good. When I, when I worked with the state, we used inmates on them, actually. We uh, outfitted them with chainsaws, had a chipper, and um, they did a pretty good job, although Russian olive does take some blood every now and then, but um okay so we're going to get into uh, a topic that uh, Catherine mentioned emerald ash borer um this is an emerald ash borer however um i do want to emphasize that we shouldn't be planting ash in cheyenne really we shouldn't be planting ash anywhere in the united states due to the plethora of insects that are attacking our ash trees including this one this is lilac ash borer um, you can see it look, looks like a wasp. It creates a very large exit hole. Um, that's on the right. The one on the left is actually scale insect. That's the oyster shell scale. And it looks uh, like a kind of rough surface on the bark. We're gonna talk more about these in our insect and disease section. Oh, so you can see Rush or uh, EAB can grow to be over 10 pounds in size. The one on the right there was caught in the Twin Cities, and he's not really happy about his dad uh, putting him into that Halloween costume. But uh, that's that's Forrester humor right there at its, at its best. Um, that was actually somebody that I knew. And uh, Emerald Ash Boar. Um, is probably the number one threat to urban forests around the country right now. Um, it is decimating many communities. Luckily, it hasn't reached Cheyenne. However, it won't be long. It's been uh, detected already in Fort Collins. It's been detected in Nebraska, South Dakota. So it's, it's, if it's not already here, um, we're likely to find it in the next couple of years. And as 
Catherine mentioned we've been doing ash evaluations for homeowners over the past couple of summers um, just to give them recommendations on how to prepare for emerald ash borer, um, whether they should um, treat their trees right now for EAB, treat them for other insects, um, re uh, remove and replace them, um, all, those, all those different options. So what are we doing here in Cheyenne? We are trapping, although trapping doesn't work very well. Branch sampling. So any of the ash that we prune or cut down, we do sample ashes by using a draw knife and, and peeling into uh, through the bark and into the cambium level to see if we have any borers. Um, luckily, we only have 5% ash on city land and about 15% 15 in our street tree population. So it's not, it's not a huge uh, problem here in terms of percentage of ash. In other communities, um, a lot of communities in Northern Montana or Montana, Northern Wyoming, Colorado have upwards of 40%, some even up to 60% ash. And we do have an EAB management plan that we've been using to manage ash over the past several years. So this is a this is probably the most famous EAB picture you'll see and it's just um, what happens when you plant a monoculture of a single species. Um, we did this also with Dutch elm disease. Many of our cities in the Midwest East Coast were planted with American elm. They got Dutch elm disease which was brought over from from Europe and Many of our streets were completely void of trees as a result. So unfortunately, we didn't learn from our mistakes. We went and replaced the uh, elm with ash, and now we're kind of in the same situation in a lot of communities. Luckily in Cheyenne, that's not the case though. So to prevent this from happening in the future, um, we really need to improve our tree diversity standards. And that means not planting the same species over and over and over. So a general rule for us, you know, when we're planting trees in the downtown, for instance, is we don't put uh, a tree of the same species next to one another. We alternate species. And some guidelines that we use is no more than 20% of a single family, 10% genus, 5% species. So um, commu different communities have, have different guidelines, but um, just think about, um, you know, if, if you're gonna plant trees on your own property that, that you try to diversify um, the tree species as much as, as much as you can. So here's the little devil right here. This is an emerald ash borer. You can see it's a beautiful insect. It, it uh, came from Asia in the early 2000s. Um, and it's been moved across the country via, via firewood. So um, don't move firewood. Uh, you know, even moving it from Cheyenne up to the mountains to go camping, you know, is, is a no-no nowadays. There's just too many, too many insects um, that you could transport. And problem is a lot of these insects come from other countries, other parts of the world, and they don't have native enemies. The emerald ash borer um, evolved in, in Asia, and there are predators in Asia, and there are checks and balances in Asia to keep this insect in check. But in the United States, in North America, there isn't. So this insect just has free, free reign, basically, and is just, like I said, decimating ash forests across, across our country. So there's a lot of information on EAB. Um, try to get informed. Um, keep an eye on your ash trees. Um, as I mentioned, species diversity is so important. Okay, now we're gonna get into some tree species that do well in Cheyenne, some trees to consider um, to plant 
um, at your property or, or wherever, if, if you get asked by others, you know, what trees do well in Cheyenne, this is a, this is a pretty good list. So Plains Cottonwood um, is a native to our riparian areas. Um, it's actually very drought tolerant. Um, it does, it has a very extensive root system. Um, it grows very large. It's probably the largest growing deciduous tree we have uh, in Cheyenne, which is a good thing because it provides a ton of shade. Um, it gives off a lot of oxygen. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really good tree. At, at first, when I moved here, I wasn't a big fan because cottonwood is short-lived. And so I always thought, why plant a short-lived tree? But um, because of all the benefits that it provides in terms of its size, and um, it's just so tough. Um, it is definitely a worthwhile tree. However, you want some space with this tree because the roots are pretty aggressive and they will push sidewalks and curbs and possibly mess with your foundation if, if they're planted too close to built, built infrastructure. Uh, let's see, some of my favorite varieties are the Sergeant Strait Cottonwood. Um, these varieties that are sold at uh, nurseries don't produce cotton, um, so that's good. And then the Lance Leaf Cottonwood is another one of my favorites. That's a cross between the Plains and the Narrow Leaf. Yes, as someone mentioned in the chat here, Catherine, um, this one is growing right over the, the cement. We see that all the time. These trees are just incredible. You know, they get big and they'll take over the site they're, they're planted in. So when I was with the State Forestry Division, one of my jobs, which was a lot of fun, was I was the um, state uh, champion tree uh, coordinator. And so I would get nominations um, of, from homeowners and citizens across the state when they thought they had a, a big tree that might be a champion. So this is actually a Eastern Cottonwood, which is a relative to the Plains Cottonwood. And you can see this was just a massive tree growing on a, right next to an irrigation ditch in Bighorn, Wyoming, which is up near uh, Sheridan area. Burrow, so here's one of my favorites that we already talked about a little bit. That was on the first slide. And bur oak, unlike cottonwood, is a much longer lived species doesn't get to the size that a that a cottonwood does. Um, you know, cottonwood might grow to 70, maybe 80 feet in Cheyenne. Um, most bur oaks are going to be in the 40, 40 foot range in Cheyenne. Uh, they're native to the Black Hills of Wyoming and South Dakota. So they are a Wyoming native. Um, you see a lot of, uh, or a fair amount of larger bur oak um, on state grounds near the Capitol, also at the State Museum, uh, Supreme Court building, we have quite a few nice Baroque. One of the downfalls to Baroque is it's a little slow growing initially. Um, it takes a while to establish those first couple of years. It wants to put down a really extensive root system before it starts to grow. But once it does grow, uh, or once it becomes established and, and starts growing, Readily, it does keep up with other species um, in terms of growth rates. So it's a really nice tree. There aren't a lot of insect disease issues with it either. Doesn't have great fall color though, but this was the state champion tree in Cody, Wyoming. Um, it is no longer the state champion. There's a bigger one now in Buffalo, but uh, this tree was brought to Cody in a coffee can from Illinois and planted at a uh, farmstead. And it's a beautiful tree. This picture really doesn't do it justice, but it's about 60 feet tall and the spread is probably 60 feet as well. This is the Colorado State Champion. And again, this picture doesn't do it justice, but this is on the grounds of uh, Civic Center Park, just right next to downtown Denver. And you can see how massive these trees are in terms of their spread. 
you know, I think the spread on this tree is just as much as the height. So without competition, without other trees growing next to it, this tree gets a gets to a, a really large canopy. Okay, hackberry. Uh, this is a tree that does well in Cheyenne. Um, doesn't grow quite to the size of cottonwood, similar to bur oak. Um, it is a longer lived tree. Um, in the Midwest, this tree is kind of frowned upon because it's um, it's a volunteer in a lot of uh, areas. It, it is a prolific seeder. Um, birds tend to eat the fruit, and so they spread the seed around quite a bit. Um, it doesn't do that really in Cheyenne. Um, it has really cool furrowed bark. It does really well in our downtown. It, it, it withstands drought conditions very well. And here is, um, this is, gosh, I'm forgetting the town now. Oh, this is Gearing. This is Gearing, Nebraska. So you can see this is in an, a row of hackberries in, in a street tree situation. Um, the reason they're so prevalent in Gearing and Scotts Bluff, I think, is because of their high soil pH there. They have more alkaline soils than we do here in Cheyenne. And hackberry just doesn't seem to mind at all. And you can see these trees are flourishing. Okay, American Linden. Um, on the left is the state champion in Casper, Wyoming. You can see the leaves are very large heart-shaped leaves. Um, this is a very pyramidal shaped tree. Um, it, it gets, the crown is larger at the base than it is at the top. Um, this tree does very well in Cheyenne. It's kind of, in my opinion, underplanted. Um, it's a uh, definitely a pollinator friendly tree. Um, both American linden and little leaf linden um, has very fragrant flowers in the spring. Um, this is also called basswood in the Midwest, where it where it grows natively. And here is a large growing. American Linden in Fort Collins. <clears throat> okay, what do we got next? Norway maple. So we don't recommend a lot of maples for Cheyenne. There are some ornamental maples that do well. Um, there's also a lot of maples in called Freeman maples or Autumn Blaze maples that are crosses between red maple and silver maple, both. Um, pretty inferior species, in, in, in my opinion, for Cheyenne. So um, don't, don't be sold on the red fall color. That's unfortunately why people buy these Freeman maples or these, um, um, they're also called autumn blaze maples, is because they're fall color. Unfortunately, they just don't like our high pH soils. And so if you're going to get a maple, um, Norway is is pretty good. It's not great, but um, uh, it's it does pretty well. It does get some sun scalding problems on the stems and frost cracking. So we do recommend wrapping the stem up to that first major branch. But um, all in all, this is a pretty good tree species. I like the Emerald Queen, the Emerald Luster, and then the Deborah are the three. Um, varieties that we tend to plant that seem most hardy to Cheyenne. And here's one growing in Cheyenne. You can see um, without competition from other trees, it gets a, a very spreading canopy as well. Doesn't get real tall either though, maybe 40 feet tall is all. Okay, Buckeye horse chestnut. Um, we do have several of these around town. Uh, the one on the right is at the the back side of the state uh, museum, I believe, and it's about maybe 35, 40 feet tall. They don't grow as, as large as they do in the Midwest where they're native. Um, they're kind of stunted in Wyoming, but very drought tolerant. Um, this is one that's definitely underplanted. Um, it's also hard to find in the nursery industry, which is a shame because um, it has great fall color, as you can see. Um, it's very drought tolerant too. One of the characteristics that is beneficial of this tree is it, if it's stressed out in the summertime, it'll just drop its leaves instead of dying back as a result of 
um, drought stress, it just drops its leaves prematurely and, and goes into dormancy early. So this is this is a really tough tree that um, you should consider planting if you want some fall color besides besides yellow. This is one growing in Billings, Montana. This is actually a horse chestnut, and this is one of the toughest growing sites you can imagine. It's in a probably three by three cutout in the cement, and it is doing just fine. So these trees are tough, um, and they'll grow in very difficult environments. You can here's just a close up of the bark. You can see kind of unite unique bark kind of flaky bark, um, furrowed bark. Also, you can get a glimpse of leaves. They have large kind of palmate leaves. Um, this is a tree growing in the back of the VA center here in Cheyenne. They have several back there that are very nice specimens. Hey, Mark. Yes. On, on that uh, Buckeye, can you talk a little bit about the leaf scorch on the margins? Sure. People, yeah, with, people usually notice that at the end of the season and go, what can I do to fix it? <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, it. I'm really not that concerned about it. A, a lot of several deciduous, deciduous trees with larger leaves, Norway maple, you will also see leaf scorch on the margins of the leaves or the outside of the leaves, especially if it's near a parking lot or it's getting a lot of... Um, heat or direct sun. Um, you know, if you see it, it is an in indicator possibly that you need to increase um, the amount of water you're giving the tree, but it's it's not, you know, a lot of trees like the Norway maple, like this tree, the horse chestnut will scorch almost every year um, to some degree late in the summer. So it, it's not super concerning, but it is an indicator that maybe you, you need to water a little bit more. Okay, here's another one, uh, honey honey locust. Um, guys are probably familiar with honey locust. It's becoming extremely popular. I'm a little concerned that we might be over planting honey locust, you know, similar to the American elm and the in the uh, green ash because it is it is so tough. Um, it grows fairly fast. Um, it has really tiny leaflets so you don't really even have to rake the leaves up they just in Cheyenne they just blow away so it's kind of a low maintenance tree but like I said keep in mind you want you don't want to overplant any one species um, keep that species diversity um, goal in mind they do great in the downtown but unfortunately we've got about 30 percent up almost close to 40 percent honey locust in the downtown just because that's what everyone planted in the day. And, and, and now, you know, if we get an insect or disease that is uh, specific to this tree, we're going to lose a lot of trees downtown, which is unfortunate. Here's a box elder. You can also call this a sensation maple. If, if you're trying to sell this tree, you definitely want to call it a sensation maple. People get turned off by box elder due to the box elder bugs. However, this tree does not produce the seed and the seed is what attracts the bugs. So you don't have to worry about attracting the box elder bugs with this tree. Um, this is kind of a shorter growing shade tree. I have one in my front yard and it's getting to about 30 feet. I don't think it's gonna get much taller. Um, it's a pretty tough tree. What's nice about it is you get some fall color. Um, it is native you know, to uh, Wyoming for the most part. Um, so this this is definitely a good tree if you're considering a maple. This is another one. I'd probably put this one on the top of my maple list in terms of shade trees. There, are, there is some frost cracking, you know, that occurs, um, some sun scalds. So it is a good idea to wrap these trees when they're young. Asian elms, so there's a lot of uh, variety of elms that have been recently developed to replace our American elms. Um, these Asian elms don't are resistant to Dutch elm disease, so you don't have to worry about that. And the unfortunate thing is they're very rapid growers. They grow very fast. 
Um, a lot of times they have poor branch connections. They require a lot of pruning, but they are very uh, drought tolerant. Um, they're very tough to our do well in our climate. So I do recommend them. My favorite is called the Accolade. Um, some of the other good varieties are Triumph, New Horizon, and Discovery. So this is a fun one if you like pruning, like me. I, I love structure pruning. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here soon. But um, you, you can prune these trees almost every season for the first probably eight, 10 years, and uh, you're not going to stress them out if, if you remove a quarter of the leaf area every year. They are just such fast growers that they can, they can recover. We've also been developing American elm that are um, tolerant to Dutch elm disease. So a lot of the American, American elm can still get Dutch elm disease, but they're tolerant of it, meaning that they don't, they're not going to die of Dutch elm disease anymore. They might transmit it, but um, they're not going to die. And so some of the better American elm uh, varieties we have now are Princeton and Prairie Expedition. Those are the two that we've been planting uh, a lot in Cheyenne. And American elm is just so unique, has such a cool growth habit. This is an American elm growing in Lions Park, and you can see why this tree was so popular in its day. Um, it's a long lived tree too, as long as it doesn't get DED, but um, beautiful, tough tree and really cool um, bran branching habit, as you can see. Okay, we're gonna get into our ornamentals now a little bit. I'm not gonna get too far into ornamental trees. Um, if you've heard any of my talks in the past, I always uh, mention um, the difference between ornamental trees and shade trees. And if you have the room, you're, you're much better off, in my opinion, to plant a shade tree. You know, everybody likes the flowers, of course, and, and some people are worried about the large size of a shade tree, but they just provide so many more benefits, you know, in terms of property values, in terms of oxygen, in, in terms of reducing pollution, um, shade, uh, reducing heating and cooling costs, um, all these things. And so if you have the space, I recommend planting a shade tree. If you don't, then, you know, consider it or an ornamental tree. And, I'm going to talk about a few here. Spring snow crab apple is one of those crab apples that's kind of being overplanted. So this is not one that I recommend planting many of. It does get um, fire blight, which is a disease, bacterial disease. And that's real common in um, apples, crab apples, uh, mountain ash, hawthorns, that, that sort of thing. So this is one that we've overplanted a little bit. You can see why it became popular because of the, the amount of flowers it has. But um, I would consider some of these other varieties instead that are more resistant to fire blight. And they include Dol Dolgo, Radiant, Prairie Fire, and Thunder Child. We have quite a few hawthorns that do well in uh, Cheyenne. This is one that's definitely um, underplanted. This is the crimson cloud hawthorn. Um, but there are a lot of other hawthorns as well that do that do just as well. I lost my PowerPoint here. What's going on? Hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hey, there we go. Uh, this one is thornless. Um, the thornless cockspur is another one that's thornless, but most hawthorns do have thorns, obviously. Okay. Any questions on uh, tree species that you want, or shade trees, since we've gone over shade trees? I'm sorry, I just advanced the... Okay, there we go. Let's figure out. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I was having trouble with my chat box. Okay. I got a question here from Dave. I see many 80 feet tall, tall blue spruce next to houses in Cheyenne. When should these be removed? Um, you know, spruce is a pretty shallow rooted tree species. It doesn't typically cause a lot of issues with foundations, 
sidewalks, that sort of thing. Um, so I don't think I'd recommend removal. Um, spruce is definitely overplanted in Cheyenne. It's the second most prevalent tree in our community. Um, I think because of the, the wind protection it provides, right? I mean, it doesn't drop its leaves like deciduous trees, so it provides good wind protection. Um, we do see some of them blow over, especially those with twin leaders. So those trees that have a double leader, they typically have a poor connection. And so um, we do see the tops blow out of them once in a while, but all in all, spruce is a pretty tough tree. So as hard as it is to grow a tree in uh, Cheyenne, I just am hesitant to cut down very many of them. All right, moving on. Here's another hawthorn, Toba hawthorn. This is the one that has the really cool bark, the kind of orangish yellow flaking bark. Um, this is a popular one for sure. Mountain ash, this is the oak leaf variety. Um, this one was actually trialed at the Arboretum west of the town. And what's unique about this one is it has an oak, oak, uh, oak shaped leaf. It's got uh, red berries. Uh, this is one growing in Britannic Gardens. Hot wings to Terry maple. This is probably the most popular maple right now. It is a pretty short growing tree. You can see um, the beautiful red Samaras. So that is actually the seed of the, of the tree. These usually turn red mid to late summer. Um, this tree was actually um, developed at the Arboretum as well. So Fort Collins Wholesale Nursery um, took some cuttings from trees at the Arboretum west of town. And one of those cuttings actually developed the first red Samaras. And so then they um, took cuttings from that tree and, and uh, patented the name Hotwing. So this is a tree that actually came, was trialed in Cheyenne. Okay, now we're going to talk about some crappy trees. I'm a forester. I typically love trees, but there are crappy trees out there, no questions. These are some trees you don't want to plant, especially if you live in town. If you live outside of town, you might consider them if you have a lot of space, but most of these trees are short-lived, fast-growing. You know, they they party hard, party, and then they they die within 20 years, typically, so... Any of these trees, I would stay away from. Spruce alternatives. So I talked about how prevalent spruce was in Cheyenne. Um, there are other conifers that do well in Cheyenne, and we should be considering these. Um, as I mentioned, spruce, spruce are pretty tough, but they do have a shallow root system. They're not as drought tolerant as some of the other conifers that are available. So some other really nice conifers to consider are white fir. White fir has soft needles. It looks like a spruce. It's just as tough as a spruce. Douglas fir is actually native to Wyoming. Has very unique uh, cones, um, similar to uh, spruce as well. Ponderosa pine is one of the toughest trees you could plant in Cheyenne or outside of Cheyenne. It's also native to Wyoming. Austrian pine, limber pine, Black Hill spruce, Norway spruce. Um, these are all trees that I would that I would plant that we've been planting in the city for quite a while. Larch is a tough one. The western larch is okay. The European larch, um, if you have a protected site, it, it does pretty well in Cheyenne, but it, that's not a super tough tree, unfortunately. Okay, we're going to take a break here. Um, you want to take like a five-minute break, Catherine, and let people stretch? Yeah, Mark, that'll work. Okay. That's, getting up and stretching is always good. And then uh, when we come back, I'm going to have a quiz for you on, on what I just talked about. <laughs> <clears throat>
for Mark? That's a great picture of where not to plant a blue spruce. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. That was in Laramie, right along Grand, is it Grand Avenue, the main drag that goes by the university? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was right on a corner there. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Because the tree looks like it's doing really well, but it's just in the hugely yeah. wrong place. Yes. Hopefully they cut it down for a Christmas tree before it <laughs> became an issue. <laughs> some, some college student probably got it as a little tiny seedling, yeah. little pencils and parked it there. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, how about we have a quiz here? So you guys can answer in the chat box. Uh, let me see, how, how much does a rooted in Cheyenne tree cost? And mind you, those trees cost rooted in Cheyenne about $150, so you're getting a heck of a deal, yes. Well done. You guys all got it. 50 bucks. Good job. And that includes planting, of course. How many years uh, has Cheyenne been a Tree City USA? Ooh, you guys are good. 40. Nicely done. Okay, let's, let's get a little more difficult here. Uh, which of the trees that I showed does very well in gearing Nebraska in high pH alkaline soils? Hackberry. Ooh, hackberry, yes, good job. Okay, you guys are paying attention. All right, any other, does anybody have any other questions on tree species before we move on? So Mark, I have a, a quiz question for the group. Good. What tree should you not plant ever? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Good. I would take Russian olive too. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Read my mind, Stacy. Yeah, you don't realize how bad of a problem the Russian olives are until you go up into the Bighorn Basin. Oh yes. And they're just they're just weeds. They're as bad as as thistle. Yes, they are. All right, should we move on? Yep. Talk a little bit about pruning. And uh, Catherine and I were chatting that we might try to do a uh, field session at some point and, and actually do some pruning um, in May. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get together and do some hands-on pruning because that's definitely the best way to learn. Okay, so I always get this question, you know, when is the best time to prune and Really, you can do it any time, you know, um, when we, when, when, you know, for us, we have so many trees we have to maintain, we just cannot prune in just the winter, although that's probably the best time to prune. Um, you can really get away pruning any time of the year, um, but winter is the best. You're not going to spread diseases. That's one of the concerns I have, you know, pruning ornamental trees when the trees leafed out is that you can actually spread um, fire blight, for instance, and other, and other diseases. So you do wanna be careful of that. Um, but really, um, you know, it, it depends on the tree species, but winter is, is probably the best time. And it, it's easiest to see the entire tree, to see all the branches, the branch unions, all that stuff when the leaves are off. So another reason to, Prune in the winter time if you can. Okay, making 
good pruning cuts is so important. Um, one of our functions with city forestry is we license all the tree companies in town and um, they have to meet a certain level of uh, professionalism. They have to have a certification through ISA, which is the International Society of Arboriculture. And, and through that certification, they get training on making pro proper pruning cuts. Um, in communities that don't license arborists, you see a lot of poor pruning cuts. Not that you don't see them here once in a while, but um, it's especially prevalent in communities that don't license arborists. So uh, the the three cut the three cut method is is so important um, in preserving that branch bark collar and that branch bark ridge. You never want to cut into that portion of the branch union. And so by making that first cut on the bottom of the branch, you are creating the location where the branch is going to break away. The second cut, uh, you cut out from the first cut, um, depending on the weight of the branch, you know, it depends how far out, but anywhere from a couple inches to a foot. As you're making that second cut, the weight of the branch is going to break into that first cut and then the branch will break away at that point. If you were to make one cut right next to the stem, what happens is, is you're not going to be able to get through that branch before the weight of the branch beats you and tears down below your cut into the main stem. And those are just nasty wounds. Whenever we get a wound inside that branch bark collar and ridge. Um, it takes a long time to seal off that wound. The tree just doesn't have that capability to, to compartmentalize that wound. So you really want to avoid making flush cuts and, and allowing um, breakage into that area. <clears throat> so as you can see, the final cut is nice and round. It's, it's uh, uh, if you have a more of an elliptical or oval cut, um, you know that you've probably cut into that collar or that ridge. So this is a really good demonstration here. You can, certain species really show the collar better than others. And here you can see it very well. So there's the collar, there's the ridge. Pretty obvious where you make the cut there, right at the edge of the collar. That's where you make your final cut. Don't want to cut into that collar or that ridge. This is a tree that was flush cut. So you can see the oval or elliptical um, wound on this tree. And they cut into the branch bark collar completely. And when you do that, that those, those cells in that branch bark collar are where those cells are that compartmentalize so well around the wound or around that cut. And so when, when you do a flush cut, you remove those cells. And in this case, you just don't see much sealing of this wound. You can see a little on the outside here and there, but what's more than likely happening is decay. You're seeing decay, you're seeing discoloration below this cut. We're probably seeing decay into the main stem and down the main stem. So this tree is going to be compromised in the near future due to decay um, because of a bad cut that was made. All right, we're going to talk some about structure pruning. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, structure pruning is something that a lot of people don't quite understand. And, and, and the goal of it is to create a strong branch structure in a young tree and to hopefully prevent damage from storms, um, heavy snow loads, ice, wind, that sort of thing. This is something that has been around for maybe 20, 25 years. And the more progressive communities um, are structure pruning their trees. We, we try to do the best we can in Cheyenne. Um, thankfully, we have a tree inventory system. And so a lot of our trees are on a rotation. So we try to get back to them on a 
fairly frequent basis to keep up with this structure pruning. If you don't, um, you can just, you know, it's, you just see a lot of damage to certain species of trees that, that tend to have poor branch unions and connections. So um, we'll go into a little of structure pruning. So this is what we want to avoid. So this is, uh, this is what I'm talking about. This is a poor union. This is a codominant stem. We like to see shade trees have a strong central leader um, all the way up the tree as far as possible, at least up 15 feet or so before they really start to fork off. Um, the tree on the left is a narrow leaf cottonwood. Um, you can see there's a lot, there's probably decay in this branch union between these two uh, stems. Um, when they're growing together like this, um, you tend to get decay pretty rapidly. And then the union is just isn't very strong. And so if you get a heavy load on one of these stems, they tend to peel off um, the other stem. And if, if that damage occurs, you just have to remove the tree. And so by structure pruning, we're trying to avoid um, allowing these weak unions to continue on the tree. We try to eliminate them when the branches are small when the wounds are small, when the tree has the capability to seal off these wounds. This was when I worked for the state, we, we had a, a, a grant program and the city of Lander um, used this grant program to plant a ton of ash. And in Lander, if you've ever been there, they get heavy, heavy snow loads. They're right up against the foothills and they don't have the wind. In Cheyenne, the wind actually saves us a lot of times because it get, the snow gets blown off the leaves. So this was, uh, I think it was a um, early fall snowstorm. And because they had several trees with co-dominant stems, they lost a ton of their green ash as a result. Um, they didn't do any, any structure pruning. And, and, and when you don't do it, you can see the result. Um, when you have a co-dominant tree, if you lose one of those stems, you have to remove the tree at this point half of the stem is now um, exposed. And so at this point, this tree is never gonna be able to seal up that wound. It's never gonna be able to recover from this kind of wound. And so the tree, all these trees with this kind of damage would have to be removed. So I'm just gonna go through some of the steps. This is one of the things that we'll probably talk about more when we're in the field. Um, we'll bring some, um, tree samples and we'll actually do some pruning of some smaller trees. Um, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to cut down healthy, uh, uh, prosperous trees. We, we usually find some Siberian elms or some other uh, trees that uh, uh, come up from seed or what have you. So, so double leaders, as I've mentioned, you want to try to avoid double leaders if you can. And, and so by pruning out that Competing leader when both leaders are small um, makes a lot of sense. And so this is where the red mark is, is where you make your, make your pruning cut. And by eliminating that leader then, um, growth can go into the leader that you wanna keep, into that strong leader. So you'll see more rapid growth in that remaining leader. <clears throat> Branch angles, this is another thing to look at. So first you look at competing leaders, then you look at branch angles. A branch angle that's more at a 10 or two o'clock is, is gonna be much stronger than an 11 or one o'clock. So branches with tight angles, you wanna prioritize pruning out um, fairly quickly. Also branch size. Um, this is kind of counterintuitive, I guess. You would think a larger branch in relationship to the in relationship to the stem would be stronger, but it's actually weaker. So if if you have a small branch and a large branch growing right on top of one another, by removing the larger branch, um, you're creating um, better branch strength or um, by leaving that smaller branch. The smaller branch has actually got a stronger connection. So keep that in mind. And so 
you know, when, when we come up on a tree such as a linden that has a lot of tight branch angles, a lot of co-dominant stems, it's hard to decide where to start, right? <laughs> right. So some of the things to just keep in mind, um, how much can I remove off a small tree? How much leaf area? A general rule that we use is, is a, about a quarter, depending on how healthy the tree is. Um, if it's really healthy and it's a fast grower like elm or cottonwood, you could remove up to a third of the leaf area in a growing season, which seems like a lot, but they, they can recover fairly quickly. So the things you look for are the double leaders, the branch angles, the branch size, and then thinking about temporary versus permanent. In our parks, along our streets, um, we try to raise up the tree so we have we don't have any low branches that are below 10 or 12 feet. In a yard situation, that might not be as important, but um, just another thing to consider pruning. So this is just an example. This is one of those fast growing accolade elms that I meant to mention, kind of a before and an after shot. And you can kind of see the cuts that were made on the tree to the right. You can see the one on the left has a very pronounced kind of double leader and that was removed. And you look at the tree on the right, um, some of those tight branch angles, those branches were removed and then we did some raising as well. So that just kind of shows you um, some of these uh, methods in, in action. Catherine says we can prune trees at LCCC. Okay, good deal. Yeah, we'll have to spend a little time uh, before um, we schedule the class and um, find some good, good trees to prune for sure. Okay, now we're going to move into proper tree planting and maintenance. If you have any questions on pruning, I know we went through that pretty fast. Um, normally, in the in-person talk, we bring in some tools as well. Um, I didn't talk too much about tools, but um, if you have questions about tools, you know, what I like to use is a Felco hand pruner, a bypass pruner. Um, the pruners that compress the branch aren't as good as the bypass. You want to get a bypass pruner because those don't damage the, uh, the branch or that the portion of the branch or the stem that that's remaining. You're not compressing the branch, you're cutting it cleanly off. And then I just like the small handsaw, folding handsaw works really good. Okay, we're getting some questions here. Let's see. Can you prune the stem? I have a hackberry that's a little bald in the middle. Is this the picture here? Um, so you're talking about pruning back to another branch. So one of the general rules we use when we're pruning the main stem is, is if we're going to, uh, reduce the size, the height of the tree that we prune back to a branch that's at least a, a, a third of the size of the main stem. So if you're going to prune back the main stem, you want to make sure you have another branch that will take the lead. So this happens, you know, this might occur if, if the top of the tree is, is killed. Um, but in this case, looking at this tree, I don't think I would prune it back per se. I think you, uh, it looks like it's struggling. It's definitely not growing that well. So I would consider watering, mulching, that sort of thing before I do any pruning. Another question we got is, can you seal a tree that has been damaged such as with tar? Um, that was a practice that was done several years ago, but is not used anymore. There are tree paints out there. There's other products that are sold um, for um, painting um, tree cut, uh, pruning cuts, but you don't need to do that. And most of the research says that that or that those products actually reduce um, the or slow the process of the tree sealing off that wound. So you never want to uh, seal any pruning cuts with any kind of sealant or wound. I think a lot of them are called wound dressings. You, you don't want to use that stuff. A living snow fence. What is your recommend for recommendation for trimming, shaping, living, living snow fence? I think is what 
question is. Um, you know, for tree rows, trees with the main purpose of blocking the uh, the wind, you know, I wouldn't prune them up. You know, when you're look when you're talking about ponderosa pine or spruce or juniper, you know, in town you see a lot of people prune those up, but um, naturally, you know, those branches in the forest could grow to the ground, and so um, that's the way I would leave them myself. Um, there isn't any detriment to leaving those those lower limbs in in my opinion all right any other questions before we move on all right here we go then okay so we're going to talk about uh, let's see here i'm just going to go ahead and Okay, buying quality trees. So it's it's a little difficult to find quality nursery stock in Cheyenne. Unfortunately, we only have one you know real retail nursery in town, um, and a lot of their trees are uh, pretty pretty large. And so a lot of people in Cheyenne, unfortunately, buy their trees at big box stores. A lot of times, the tree species that they bring in aren't. Um, hardy to our climate. So if you're buying a tree to big box store first, check that hardiness zone, make sure it's a four or below, and then check the species. There are a lot of species that are hardy to Cheyenne in terms of hardiness zones, but just don't like our alkaline soils, a lot of the maples, a lot of the oaks. And so you might want to cross-reference um, with a list from, from our website. You know, we've got a list of um, hardy trees for Cheyenne. Um, rooted in Cheyenne also has a list, but um, just be aware that uh, probably a third to a half of the trees sold in our big box stores just don't survive in Cheyenne or they're not real suitable to Cheyenne. Aspen is one, you know, unfortunately we love Aspen because it reminds us of the mountains, but Aspen just does not do well in Cheyenne and is a real money pit in terms of um, having to treat it for a number of insect disease problems. So, so hardy species, you got to look for that first. Are there insect and disease problems with, uh, with a specific tree species? You don't want to plant, for instance, ash. You know, we've been talking about that one. Make sure the tree is healthy and vigorous, uh, has good form. You know, a lot of these trees pictured are at top-notch nurseries, and so they have very good form. And then adequate root ball size. So if you're buying a tree that's an inch and a half caliper, for instance, it has to be at least a 20-inch diameter root ball. And then take a look at the root condition. Um, you know, when I go to a nursery, I'll pull the tree out of the pot and take a look at the condition of the roots. If there's a ton of large circling roots, um, I'll put it back and, and walk away because those circling roots tell you that tree's been in the pot a long time. And so you don't want to, you want to stay clear to those trees. Okay. So plant the tree properly. So some of the steps that we take when we're planting uh, potted and B&B &B trees is find the root flare. That is so important. The root flare is where the stem transitions to the root system and, and it gets a little larger at, at that point. It's very, very visible in that root ball on the left. Oftentimes in potted and in B&B &B trees that uh, root flare is buried. And so you have to dig down and find that root flare. If you were to plant the tree on the right at that depth where the root, where the, where the uh, soil has been piled on top of the root flare, you've now planted the tree four, five inches too deep. And so the tree's not gonna get that level of moisture or oxygen that, that it was used to. And unfortunately, this is a real common practice. Cut circling roots. So that's a typical potted tree in the upper right there. Unfortunately, that tree's been in the pot a little too long. If you were to plant that without um, treating those roots, um, those roots are just going to continue to circle in the hole. Um, you'll get some root growth out horizontally, but most of them are just going to keep circling because that's what they've been doing. 
So what we do is, is we have to cut those roots and we use the box cut method. I'm going to show you, show you how that's done. So this is a picture of some trees here in Cheyenne. I have to go out and inspect landscaping on a lot of new developments. So I, I see all kinds of poor practices, unfortunately. Um, the one on the left, um, you can see our crappy Cheyenne soil on top was piled on top of the root ball. You can see probably the good Oregon soil there below is dark black. So you never want to pile soil on top of the root ball because again, you're limiting the amount of oxygen and water that are going to get to that root system. Do you guys see a root flare on this stem? I sure don't. It just looks like a telephone pole, doesn't it? You should be seeing that transition from the main stem to the roots. And, and that, that is probably, who knows, four or five inches down into the root ball. So this landscaper didn't find the root ball, just dumped it in the hole, unfortunately. And then here, picture on the right, you can see those circling roots very visible. Um, it's kind of the drawback to planting potted trees is that you, you got to really take take care to cut those circling roots. Look at this large circling root on this tree. Um, that circling root is probably going to girdle that stem at some point if it doesn't blow over because these roots aren't taking, aren't growing out into the soil much. They're just continuing to circle. So to prevent this, um, what we do, as I mentioned, is we do the box cut and we just take a handsaw. We have circling roots and you can see this root ball is not terribly bad, but you can still see circling roots. We'll do the box cut, which just means cutting down that root ball on four or five sides. So we, so we sever all those circling roots. And what they found is where you make that cut on those roots is, is you get all these root hairs that are going to grow out from where that cut was made, similar to like a topping cut. And so from that point, all those roots hairs are now growing out into the native soil and they're growing horizontally where you want them to be growing instead of continuing to circle in the hole. And then on the right, this is another potted tree where we had to dig down. It's not the best picture, but you kind of see the line where the soil was. We had to dig down probably two, three inches here to find that root flare. And you can really see that first main root there. So this is where the tree should be planted at ground level. It's right at that main, main root. How many box cuts should, should you make? Enough to get all the way around that root ball. So depending on the size of your saw, um, reciprocal saw works really good with a 12 inch blade. Um, but it does take four or five cuts typically. Okay, you're planting whole. So one thing that we preach when we're planting these rooted in Cheyenne trees is to plant a wide hole. We're often um, planting with five to eight volunteers. And so we have plenty of manpower. So if you've got the equipment, you've got the time, dig a wide hole because that allows you to work up that soil. Um, there's a lot of compaction in our soils, especially in new developments where they build new homes um, in residential areas, commercial developments, you just see a lot of compaction. So the more that you can work up that soil around the root ball, the, the faster those roots are going to be able to grow into that, that soil and, and get established quicker. What I see a lot in the field, unfortunately, is, is landscapers trying to shoehorn these trees right into the smallest hole possible. You know, it's like a competition sometimes. Okay, we got another question on bare root stock. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to talk much about bare root stock just because um, it's not readily available. However, you can order bare root stock pretty easily. Um, what's nice about bare root stock is there's not, not, nothing hiding the root system. So you can um, evaluate the root system very easily. And if you need to um, cut circling roots or if you need, you know, if there's dead roots, you cut those out. Um, so it's nice because you can see the root system. Um, the drawback is, you know, you have to keep those roots 
moist at all times. So when you get them in the mail and, and they're stuffed with wet newspaper or sawdust or what have you, you know, make sure that you keep that root system moist until you plant it. Um, we used to do a lot of bare root trees um, and it just, it requires a little extra work in terms of keeping the, the roots moist, but um, the planting um, is, is, you know, similar. Um, so yeah, I, I would recommend bare root stock, but just make sure you know what you're doing. Okay, so this is kind of what we're looking for. Um, this is a B and B tree, and you can see the root, the trunk flared, very visible. You can see that that um, is planted above the soil line. Um, you can see they dug a very wide kind of sloping hole. Um, that's going to encourage uh, root growth from the root ball. Um, the staking, you know, in Cheyenne, we have to stake our trees due to our wonderful wind. Um, we we put three stakes on our trees with the city, but two is two is probably adequate. Um, make sure that you're using fabric type ties, arbor tie type ties. Um, you don't want to use wire right up onto the stem or twine because you can damage the damage the stem. Um, mulching is very important, you know, two to, uh, well, this one says one to two inches. Oh no, two to four. I usually recommend two to four um, inches of mulch. And then you want to water your trees in too as you're planting them um, to get the soil to settle. You don't want to jump on the soil to compact it. You just want to firmly compact it with your foot or with your hand to get some of those air pockets out, but you definitely want to water that tree in good. And then um, one thing we do is if we have extra soil, we will build a, a well around the root ball. Um, so when you're watering the tree by hand, you can kind of fill up the well and the water won't, won't, won't run away from the root system. That works pretty well. Uh, don't amend the soil. You know, a lot of people think you should amend the soil because we got crappy soils. But what we found is that the roots will tend to stay where the soil's been amended. So if you're going to amend the soil, you have to amend the whole yard. So, so don't don't amend the whole. I think I talked about the rest of that. Okay, mulching. Mulching is very important. It's mulching newly planted trees with wood chips, bark, or rock um, will do a lot of positive things for the tree. Mulch is a, as large an area as possible. We try to mulch at least a four foot um, diameter um, mulch ring around newly planted trees. Um, the larger the area, the better though. Some of the benefits to mulching, you know, in our city parks, the biggest benefit is we keep those lawn mowers and string trimmers away because grass doesn't typically grow very well in the mulch, although we still have to go back and, and spray grass, you know, with Roundup. But biggest benefit for us, it keeps the string trimmers away because they do serious damage to young tree stems. Uh, retains soil moisture. You know, a lot of the research shows it retains 30% more soil moisture if, if you mulch. Uh, wood mulch improves the soil nutrient levels. It improves soil aeration and it reduces soil temperature extremes. So if you're considering rock or wood chip mulch, you know, which is better? Um, you know, both of them um, definitely help the tree, um, wood chips and wood bark, you know, help improve the soil conditions a little, a little bit. So that would be preferable, but um, rock mulch still holds soil moisture and it, it still reduces um, grass and, and weeds from growing in there. So uh, the benefit to rock is you don't have to replace it as often. Although in, in our wind, I, th I think you still do once in a while. Don't do the mulch volcanoes. 
You see it a lot in the south for some reason. Never want to apply more than four inches of mulch around the stem. And then maintain those, those mulch rings. Pull the grass and the weeds or use glyphosate. So glyphosate is the active ingredient in, in Roundup. Um, just make sure you're just using glyphosate. There are other Roundup products that have additional chemicals that are detrimental to trees, such as you've probably heard of ground clear, and there's some others, but um, just make sure you're using glyphosate. And then, of course, you're going to have to replace your mulch every several years. I see this so often. This is really frustrating, but... Um, you know, lawn care companies in particular don't always train their summer help to be careful around trees. And that includes us at the city. Um, you know, we see a lot of damage from string trimmers and, and mowers, which is un unfortunate, especially to young trees. You know, young trees are more vulnerable because they have thinner bark. You might recognize this location. This is... Uh, along Yellowstone and somebody called me up and said all oh, those trees on Yellowstone are dead by Albertsons and uh, they thought it was you know an insect or you know they always they always suspect an insect you know they don't think it's uh, man or neglect or you know and in this case it was more damage string trimmer damage and so, you know, why did this occur? Because the grass was growing right up to the stem. So that's why it's important to mulch and to make sure that that grass doesn't encroach on your trees. So there's, uh, which um, you can see pictures of trees here with root systems. You know, a lot of people think roots grow down six, eight feet, and there's a tap root that, you know, grows down even further, but in, the reality is most of our roots, tree roots are in that top 12 inches. And so they're competing with the roots of our, of our turf grasses. And you know how thick turf grass is, right? If you've ever rolled out sod, imagine rolling that sod up right next to the stem of a young tree whose roots have recently been cut. You know, they're trying to uh, adapt to our climate. And now they have this carpet of competing roots over the top of them that are just going to steal all the water and nutrients. So never, never roll sod up next to a small tree and try to keep that grass away if you can. And uh, turf grass does emit a chemical that prevents um, tree root growth as well. And so they're um, there's so many reasons just to try to keep that turf grass away if you can. There are sod cutters. I don't know if you've ever seen sod cutters, but what we've done in several parks where we had turf growing up to trees, we, we sod cut around trees and just remove the turf and then we mulch, mulch that area. But you can use Roundup. That picture of that aspen on the top there, that was in this small town of Mountain View. This public works guy figured it out. He's like, man, my help has been doing so much damage to my trees. I just decided I'm going to start spraying, spraying Roundup. And it looks, doesn't look as nice as mulch, but, you know, you're keeping that grass away. You're preventing that damage to the stem. Yeah, this is just a... Uh, a little bit more on Roundup. Um, a lot of the Roundup um, products now have additional chemicals besides glyphosate. So be sure to read the label, the ground clear, like I mentioned. Um, there's a product, there's a chemical called Amazapic that is just deadly on trees. And it, it's not on the front of the label, you know, it's a lot of people think Roundup is Roundup, but it really isn't. So be careful using Roundup and other herbicides. So this is a great example right here of a comparison of a tree, plant two trees planted at the same time, same species, one growing in turf, one growing in mulch. And it's hard to tell the one on the right is in mulch, but it's in 
wood chip mulch with uh, ground junipers, basically. The one on the left has got a turf spray irrigation system. The one on the right has got a drip irrigation system. And you can see the, si the difference in size, the difference in health. This tree on the left is just an ugly duckling, you know, begging to be cut down. And the one on the right is thriving. If you look at some of the new growth on the ends, it's probably growing three feet a year or so. So, and, and the reason the one on the left is, is struggling is, is the mower damage mainly. But it's also the competition too, between the turf and the tree. Just some nice examples of landscaping with mulch, the top ones in Casper, the bottom ones at uh, Shattern State, I believe. And rock mulch works well too. You know, we see a lot of rock mulch. The benefit is that you don't have to replace it very often. Um, you can put weed barrier under it, under the rock mulch as well um, to prevent um, uh, grass and weeds from growing in there. But, you know, typically what I see with uh, weed barrier is that, you know, dirt and soil blows in on top of the weed, area, weed barrier. And so, I'm not a big fan of it because eventually you're going to still get weeds growing on top of on top of weed barrier, unfortunately. Other options for mulch that we see a lot of are these rubber mats. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's kind of lazy man's mulch as far as I'm concerned. Um, it does work for a while, but I've seen grass grow on top of that as well. So everything requires some kind of maintenance. Um, whether it's rock or chips or even these rubber mats. So um, can't get around that, unfortunately. Okay, staking, protecting. So in our climate, our environment, you do have to stake trees, no question about it. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, just make sure you're not over tightening the wires or the straps. You, you want to allow some sway. Um, one of the ways that the tree um, develops trunk taper is by moving in the wind. And so by strapping it up really tight, it's not gonna develop that trunk taper. It's not gonna become as wind firm. And so allow some sway. You wanna remove it after one to two years or else the straps can start to girdle the tree. Bamboo, don't put bamboo on trees. You know, bamboo is used in the nursery to grow a, a straight stem. Once you get the tree from the nursery, you want to take that bamboo. The tape that they use to strap the bamboo to the stem um, is really good at girdling the stem. So take that off as soon as, as soon as you can. Hey Mark. Yes. On that bamboo stake. Why, why is the industry doing that? Because that just makes me crazy. I'll, when I say that, yeah. I usually try to remove it or cut it off. I think it's just laziness. Yeah, I know it's frustrating. You know, once in a while we might bam, you know, we get trees from Oregon sometimes that are kind of floppy because they'll put on three, four feet of growth a year. And so they might, a bur oak or an elm might be a little floppy. So we might put on bamboo for a year. But just to plant it with bamboo on it as a practice is, is really poor practice. And some of our landscapers in town are doing it. And I, I just was at a site yesterday, actually, where most of the trees had bamboo on them. And there was no reason for it. Yeah, there, it's, I don't know why the nurseries go to the extra cost to put it on. And then, and you're right, I think that the the, the uh, landscapers just don't know any better. Yeah, and some of them claim that they're going to come back and take them off, but <laughs> yeah. most of the time that doesn't happen. No. <clears throat> okay. Trunk protectors, trunk wrap. So trunk protectors are you know, pretty important if you've got a large rabbit or squirrel population, like for instance, in Holiday Park, where we've just got an overabundance of squirrels due to the, the public feeding that, that occurs there. Um, we have to put 
trunk protectors on all our trees, else they chew up the bark and, and kill our young trees. So depending on your neighborhood, you know, I've got a lot of rabbits in my neighborhood. So um, I usually put on a trunk protector when I plant a new tree, especially my front yard. Um, and then we've talked a little bit about trunk wrap. Trunk wrap is only necessary on a few species. Um, I'd recommend it for maples. Um, lindens, I would consider it, um, but that's about it. And, and usually it's for about the first five years and then um, it's not likely to occur after that. You just wrap it up to the, the first main, main branch. You wanna um, put the wrap on in the fall and, and take it off in the um, spring. And that just pre prevents frost cracking or sun scald. And that typically happens on the south or west side of the tree. So in the winter, on a warm day, when the sun is hitting that side of the tree, the tree will start to transpire somewhat. So it'll start to move water from the roots up through the stem. And as it's doing that, if the temperature drops, like say at, at dusk, um, those that side of the tree that's moving water, that water can freeze inside the, the uh, xylem or the cambium, and then that portion of the stem will, will, will become damaged or um, there'll be some dieback there. And so by uh, wrapping it, it doesn't tend to do that as often. So um, that's kind of the reasoning behind the wrapping. Watering, probably the most important maintenance activity that you can do for your trees in Cheyenne. There's no question about it. Um, you know, when I go look at trees, when I get called to an unhealthy tree, you know, more often than not, it's lack of water. You know, there's this, um, there's this thought that trees um, whether they're small, large, young, or old, can fend for themselves um, to get to get enough moisture. And I, and as as I've tried to to harp on you tonight, you know, in Cheyenne, trees aren't native, and and they just cannot make it on their own. So, watering is so so important. Turf irrigation systems really depends how you've got your system set up. If you're watering every day or every other day, you're not doing your trees a lot of good. You wanna water at the most twice a week. That helps your turf as well. That establishes a deeper turf root system, but um, it helps your trees more than anything. It, it, you wanna water uh, a greater amount less frequently if you can. That's gonna benefit both your turf and your trees. For newly planted trees, we do recommend hand watering, even if you have a turf irrigation system, just to get enough water to the root ball. And a great way to do that is using these, these water bags. These water bags hold typically 15 to 20 gallons. Um, a small tree that's an inch and a half caliper requires 15 gallons of water twice a week during the growing season. So all you'd have to do is fill up that bag twice twice a week and, and you'll be in good shape. Well, Mark, a comment yeah. on watering. Yeah. So last year with it being so hot and dry, um, I I plant, I personally plant a lot of bare root trees and the master gardeners have a bare root tree sale. Sure. And so my recommendation to people in the little tag that I put on the trees is always, you know, water every other day for bare root mm -hmm. trees. But last year I found because it was so hot and dry that I was watering my trees every day, my bare root ones. Oh. Mm -hmm. And on a couple of days I watered, I actually watered them twice a day. Yeah. So, I, and that and that also is my number one problem when I'm out in the field. I People have either planted the tree incorrectly or they're not watering enough. And yeah. it's just like you said, it's like, well, let's stick it in the ground and the lawn sprinkler comes on and that's yeah. all it gets. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Trees that are grown in, you know, nursery grown trees get watered every day. There's no question. And so there's different recommendations on watering. Typically, if, if you have a larger B&B &B uh, tree with a large root systems, you're not going to have to water as much. And then as you move to a potted tree, the smaller root system, you are gonna have to water a little more. And then as you move to a bare root tree, you're going to have to water even more 
during that establishment period, especially during hot and dry periods, like Catherine mentioned. All right, just some examples here. Uh, you know, there's a B and B tree that we planted in Sheridan, and you can kind of see the well that we put around that tree. Works really good, you know, for filling up the well, letting the water soak all the way in, filling up the well again, letting it soak in good. Um, really requires you to kind of take your time watering. Um, there's a smaller water bag for shrubs, a, a lower water bag, a donut shaped one that you can purchase. And then I just put a picture of some Netafim in there, some inline um, drip system tubing that we use a lot for our trees. We put tree rings around a lot of our trees in dry land areas. So that's something to consider. You know, if, if you're xeriscaping your yard, you know, don't forget to put drips, you know, a drip system to your trees. Your trees can't survive without, without supplemental water, as I've mentioned. So, so okay. Mark, quick, yeah. Mark, quick question that in that last picture, that, that looked like a swamp white oak that was being planted. By the two guys here? Yep. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. That's a, it could be, yeah. So I, I'm noticing that a lot more of those are being planted in the Cheyenne area, the swamp whites. Uh-huh. Do you do I do like think, them? Do you think they're gonna do okay? Uh <laughs> we you know, we have a few in Lions Park that are doing pretty good. Um, they're not crazy about our alkaline soil, so they struggle a little bit. I think they do better in older neighborhoods. Um I kind of like the heritage oak a little better. That's a cross between an English oak and a burr oak. That one seems to be a little more tolerant of our high pH soils. Um, swamp white oak is a beautiful tree, no question. Okay, the question I always get, you know, or is when when is my tree, when are my trees established or when do I can I stop um, hand watering them? And, and when is the turf irrigation system enough to sustain them? And really when it usually takes in the neighborhood of three to five years in Cheyenne, but when they start putting on active growth, and these are just pictures of a bur oak and a hackberry that have started to put on that elongated growth at the ends of the branches. And that tells me that trees established. And so now they should, you know, if 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 your if your turf is doing fine um, and you're not watering every day or every other day, you have a, a good cycle set for your turf, then your trees should be should be okay. You won't have to hand water. Except for in the winter, right? When you turn off that irrigation system, we still have to hand water trees once a month. Um, I recommend 10 gallons per inch of caliper once a month on, on warm days. So for this tree on the left, let's just say it's four inches caliper. In the winter time on, on a warm day, I, I water this tree 40, 40 gallons. This is kind of what I talked about, adjusting that turf irrigation system to benefit both the tree and the turf. Aerating is important as well. Um, Aerating helps um, get oxygen to the roots. Um, it helps break up dense areas uh, within the soil profile as well. It allows for moisture to penetrate through that turf grass. So if you can aerate once in the spring and once in the fall, you're gonna be helping both your turf and your trees out. And then the supplemental watering that I mentioned, um, evergreens, it's even more important in the winter because evergreens continue to photosynthesize and transpire. So they're actively moving water even in the winter. So with, if we have a dry winter where we're not getting much snow melt, um, the ends of the branches on evergreens can burn or turn, turn red if, if you're not watering, watering those trees. Talked about protecting the trunk and then 
fertilization. I don't really recommend doing anything special for trees as far as fertilizing. Whatever you're using for your lawn should be adequate for your trees. We don't do any fertilization for, for our trees. Okay, what do you think? Should we keep going or should we take a, take a break? I think we've got one more section left. Should we take another five minute break? Is that okay? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think get up and get a glass of water or something. Sure. And, yeah. And then I'll, I'll have another quiz for you when we get back. If you have any more questions, on anything we've gone over, please uh, put them in the chat. Any more pictures, go ahead, post those. If you wanna to try to stump a forester, you could uh, put up some pictures of tree species. We'll, we'll, we'll see if you can stump me. Yep. Okay, we'll see you in five. All right. <clears throat> I 
The ones in his group. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so Mark, it looks like you got a couple more questions. Yeah. All right. Is there a proper way of removing a juniper? <laughs> a pickup truck and a chain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I junipers, yeah, they're just so darn tough. I'd question why you want to remove one, but uh, you know, if it's dead or if it's in the wrong spot or you know, you don't have space for it or um yeah cutting it down with a chainsaw probably hiring you know an arborist to do it or um yeah they have a pretty good root system you know tough pretty strong wood so i mean grinding the stump out is probably uh going to be required pulling it out of the ground is pretty difficult unless you got a real small one uh, what trees do you like in a living snow fence for this area? Um, you know, the toughest conifers, you know, as I mentioned, Rocky Mountain juniper, ponderosa pine, those are two really good ones. Um, as far as, you know, deciduous trees, cottonwood is still really tough. So plains cottonwood, lance leaf cottonwood, um, hackberry is also really tough. Um, as far as shrubs, you know, we have several plums, um, cherries. Um, I kind of like the sand cherry. I think that's a cool shrub. Um, let's see, next question. Um, are you concerned with bunches of above ground roots? Is that diagnostic of overwatering or compacted soil? It kind of depends. Um, there are some species that just have a lot of roots at the surface, you know, several poplar species, you know, similar to cottonwood, um, have a lot of roots at the surface. Um, it's not necessarily because of over or undering water, over or under watering. Um, could be compacted soil to some degree, um, but it's mainly related to the, the tree species. Good questions. Let's see, I need some quiz questions here. Um, when structure pruning a young tree, what are some of the things you look at within the tree in terms of branches to remove? What 
what defects or conditions are you looking for for possible pruning? I talked about several things you should look for. Let's see what people got here. Angle, very good. So you like a wide angle versus a narrow angle. So if you see branches with narrow angles, those are candidates for removal. Two leader, very good. You want to prune out one of those competing leaders. Thickness or size, right? The larger the branch in relationship to the main stem, the weaker the attachment. Narrow angles, very good. Branch size, larger branch pair, very good. Okay, um, how much of the leaf area or do you want to prune out of a young tree? What's the limit? typically, in terms of percentage of the leaf area. Okay, so I got one third, I got 25%, so that's, that's good. Um, a quarter to a third. I, you know, most tree species, it'll probably be a quarter, but we do have some faster growing trees, such as elm and cottonwood, that could withstand probably a third. Very good. Let's see, what's another one I talked about here? Um, what part of the uh, branch stem connection do you not want to cut into? We, I talked about two of these areas. The collar, very good. The collar and the ridge. Remember that ridge as well. You never want to cut into that, but the collar is probably the better answer because you're more likely to cut to the collar than to the ridge. So well done. Okay, we're going to move on to our final section here. It's eight o'clock, so we've got plenty of time. Again, if you want to ask me any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. I think there'll be some time at the end as well for your questions, but we'll get rolling here. All right, so we tried to come up with some insect and disease issues, abiotic issues that are pretty common in Cheyenne or that we're seeing in Cheyenne. And the first one is the spruce ips beetle. This is one that's been very frustrating to me. Um, I've been with the city almost 10 years and this probably started up in my second year on the city with the city. So a lot of people are like, did you bring this with you when you moved here? And I tell them, of course not, but it's, it's something that just has not gone away. Ips beetle is not a very aggressive beetle compared to like mountain pine beetle, like it's not gonna kill off our entire spruce forest in a year or two, but it just slowly picks away at our spruce population. And over the last eight years, this has consistently been an issue every year and it continues to be an issue. And it's frustrating to me, but um, it's because we've got such a high population of spruce We've got a lot of older spruce, and then we've got a lot of spruce that are not being cared for, unfortunately. This beetle goes after trees that are old, that are that have low energy reserves, that are struggling. The beetle can actually sense that. And so um, this, this tree, for instance, this was in a city right-of-way area um, where we turned the irrigation off. Um, during COVID, we didn't have staffing for some of our lawn care activities, mowing and string trimming. And so we shut the water off and that was the, uh, you know, that led to the demise of these trees. Without that consistent watering that these trees were used to, they became weakened and these beetles took care of the rest. It's unique about Ips beetle is it attacks the top of the tree first. Mountain pine beetle goes for the lower portions of the stem first. 
This field goes right to the top. It prefers smaller diameter wood compared to larger diameter, diameter wood. And so this is the typical um, pattern of dieback. It starts from the top and works its way down. Once a tree gets spruce ips beetle, it's pretty much a lost cause. I've seen some homeowners try to just cut the dead portions out of it and then spray insecticide on the rest of the tree to prevent infestation, but usually doesn't work very well. So that's spruce ips uh, beetle. Um, you can spray insecticides preventative insecticides to the stem to prevent infestation. We do that every spring and summer. The problem with this beetle is it has two generations per year instead of just one. So you gotta spray twice. Um, so it's a tough one. Um, the reason it hasn't um, been eradicated is because of firewood more than likely. This is how the Sips beetle looks. It's a pretty small beetle. You can tell it from a mountain pine beetle because its back end looks like it's been blown off. It doesn't have a <laughs> rounded, rounded black back end. It's like got a shattered or sharp back end. And ips, you you the spruce ips, of course, is found in spruce trees. There are other spruce. Ips beetles that like pine um, hasn't that hasn't been as prevalent in Cheyenne, however, luckily. And then management, uh, you know, make sure you're you're keeping your spruce healthy. You know, that's the big one. You know, watering them. I mean, just think about all the wind that we've had. Um, that wind over the weekend that was very damaging to our spruce trees. Right, it blows off needles causes the tree to transpire and, and lose water, um, cause uh, desiccation to the needles. And so making sure we're winter watering our spruces is, is so important. And then there are several uh, insecticides that can be sprayed to the top of the tree and to the stem to prevent infestation. So if you have it, um, should you treat it? I got a question on that. And, and as I mentioned, you know, what I do is I probably have an arborist come out and go up in a bucket truck and look at the top of the tree. If it's dying down, dying back and dying back rapidly. I mean, if you see red needles, um, that tells me it's dying back rapidly. Have the top of the tree inspected. They can identify whether it has ips or not. If it does, it's probably a lost cause. Like I said, you can try cutting the infested part out and spraying insecticide on the on the rest of it, but it probably works maybe 20 to 30% of the time. So keeping your trees healthy is the most important thing. So Mark, when you talk about keeping your trees healthy, yep. you want to define that for the group? Well, for spruce trees, because they're shallow rooted, um, they just need supplemental water. And as I've said with evergreens, they really need winter watering because of our high winds and the fact that they continue to transpire. They don't go into complete dormancy like deciduous trees. So the watering is the most important thing. Mulching is also a good idea. Um, making sure you're not damaging the root system of spruce. That's another time when they get hit by this beetle is when construction occurs on top of the root system. Like if you pour a new driveway and you know you dig down eight inches and you sever a bunch of roots, you know that's gonna cause the tree to go into shock and be vulnerable to Ips attack. So just, you know, doing those, those small things to keep, to keep your trees healthy and avoiding the major damage to the root system. Okay, I mentioned oyster shell scale earlier on ash tree. This is a good example of it. You can see all these tiny oyster looking insects. And what they do is they put their mouth parts into the cambium and they suck water and nutrients from the phloem and the xylem. And they slowly 
kill the tree. This is on an aspen, it looks like. So it's real prevalent in ash, in aspen, in cottonwood. Um, the good thing is this insect can is easily treatable with, um, with insecticides. So um, there's several insecticides that work pretty good. We like to use dinoteferin. That's an insecticide that you'd have to hire somebody to spray because you do have to have a license for that. But we just do a, a bark spray. We spray it on the bark and then it's taken in. Um, it's a uh, uh, it, it's moved through the tree and wherever those insects are, they're they're killed by that insecticide. There's also different ways you can apply it through the soil. You can do a soil drench where you pour it around the stem. Um, that's oyster shell scale, very common in Cheyenne. <clears throat> Cytospora canker, this is a fungus. It's found in a variety of trees and shrubs, probably most common in cottonwood and spruce. Um, in spruce, it slowly kills branches. Um, doesn't typically get into the main stem, but it can. It is good at killing smaller trees pretty rapidly. You can see the fruiting bodies on this cottonwood tree. There's not a lot you can do for it. Um, you can prune out branches that are infected, uh, but other than that, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. You can see this one on a uh, spruce branch here. It does have kind of a gall-like appearance. Again, preventing me mechanical damage, making sure the tree's healthy, um, pruning out those branches that are infested, infected. One of the reasons this becomes so prevalent is after we get hailstorms, there's a lot of open wounds on branches. So there's a pathway for this canker to get, to get into the tree. Emerald ash borer. So this is one I've talked a little bit about already. Um, as I mentioned, ash is pretty prevalent in Cheyenne. It's you know five to fifteen percent of our tree canopy, depending on where you live. Um, many people are already treating their trees in Cheyenne. Um, you know, the good thing about this insect is it's been here since 2002, so they've had time to develop very effective insecticides. And these insecticides, you don't have to spray. Um, they're systemic, and so you can apply them as a basal drench um, around the stem. You can inject it into the tree, and they show very good um, effectiveness at preventing EAB infestation. So they're very effective. Um, the problem is EAB is likely never going to go away once it is established in a community. Um, you know, with native insects, there's usually uh, ebb and flow, a rise and a fall um, of uh, the populations of insects. But with EAB, what they're finding is where it was discovered in 2002 in Michigan, it has never left. It, it continues to infest trees. Um, as long as there's ash around, it's, it's probably not gonna go away. And so if you have an ash tree and once we get EAB in Cheyenne, you're gonna have to treat your tree for the life of the tree more than likely. It is hard to detect EAB. That's one of the real difficult things about it. It's in Boulder, for instance, when they detected the first emerald ash or infestation, they dated back um, that infest that infested tree, and it was four or five years old. So it had been infested for five years before it was detected, and that's pretty common. It's just it doesn't show you a lot of outward signs, and ash is just struggling because of all the other insects we have. So. Um, it's very difficult to uh, to detect, unfortunately. Hey, Mark. Yeah. There's a question here from Mike. If we think we have it, how do we get it treated? 
for EAB. Yeah. Yeah. So if for EAB, if you think you have it, you know, we would come out and, and look, um, you know, if you see those D shaped exit holes, um, like I said, we haven't found it in town. We've been sampling all, everything that we prune or remove. We haven't found it. Doesn't mean it's not here. So um, there are similar bores to EAB that are native that have that green tinge. So we have seen some, you know, look-alike kind of insects. But um, if you think you have it, we can come take a look if you'd like. So the one of the things we've been doing with our ash trees on city property is really taking a look at their health and determining whether, you know, once once we find e EAB, whether we want to treat those for the life of the tree or whether we would prefer to remove those ash trees and replant with another species. Um, typically, <coughs> You have a large ash tree that you've you've invested a lot in that's very valuable to you and that's healthy those are the trees that you're going to want to treat if you have a younger tree they haven't invested a lot in or if you have a tree that's already sickly unhealthy those are the trees you probably want to remove and replace so we've been doing a lot of tree removals um, of unhealthy ash trees on, on city properties. And that's kind of what we've been encouraging the public to do as well. And it's kind of a tough pill to swallow, but you know, if, if you've already got a tree that's not in good shape, you know, um, why invest money for the life of the tree, you know, in a tree that's not that valuable. So, you know, a lot of times it's better just to, to start over, unfortunately. So you can kind of see the life cycle of the EAB here as well. Um, one thing that's kind of unique about it is it, it, it bores deeper into the stem than most of our beetles, most of our native beetles. And that's why we have to use a draw knife to actually um, get into the uh, hardwood, you know, below the sapwood um, to, to, to look for the bore. So it makes it even harder to, to detect. This is the list of a lot of the um, insecticides that are available for EAB. And as I mentioned, a lot of them are very effective and um, you don't need to treat every year. There are several that um, are effective up to three years. So you treat once every three years. So, Mark, on the emerald ash borer, yeah, actually on any of these insect problems, don't you think this the uh, the trunk injections are by far superior treatment to spraying? Yes. Yep. The, the The nice thing about the injections is none of the product is exposed to the environment, so there's no chance of any drift of herbicide, you know, onto your neighbor's property or onto a playground or a school. Um, so yeah, the, um, the injections are the way to go. And there's a couple different injection systems, but um, they both work very well. Um, we have an arbor jet system that we use where we have to drill in uh, about an eighth of an inch uh, we put in these little plugs and then we inject uh, in insecticide into these little plugs at intervals around the tree. And it's really nice because, like I said, none of the insecticide gets, gets on the ground or is exposed to the environment or the air or anything. So it's pretty safe for the environment. Okay, moving on, lilac ash borer. This is a native. This is one that we see all over Cheyenne. Um, creates large exit holes. Um, the adult is a wasp type looking insect. Um, has very large larvae or grubs. Um, typically attacks the 
the the union of the, the branch and the stem. It's a tough one to treat for, unfortunately. Um, but again, it goes after stressed trees primarily. Um, we do have to spray for this one. But we get a lot of calls on this one. People think they have EAB and they actually have lilac ash borer. And this one is, is less destructive and it doesn't have the D-shaped exit hole. So that's the big, big difference between this one and emerald ash borer. <clears throat> some more pictures on lilac ash borer. You can see the round exit holes. And as I mentioned, this one requires spraying the trunk, which is unfortunate, but systemics don't seem to work on this one. Another, uh, this is a bi abiotic issue we see a lot in Cheyenne due to our winds is um, winter desiccation of evergreens. That's why you've heard me talk about winter watering so often. Um, you know, it seems like every year we get calls on browning of needles and dieback of conifers. And um, sometimes they can, they're moving water and we might have a, uh, a freeze in early fall that causes um, dieback as a result of the, the young growth at, at the tips of the branches, um, still moving water, we might see that, but in most cases, it, it's just due to our winds, you know, our winds that dry out the tree, uh, the tree doesn't have enough moisture, and, um, you know, we see this desiccation, so that's why the winter Winter watering is so important. If you have a living snow fence out of town, you know, I recommend putting up the slatted snow fence so that you can catch some of that blowing snow and pile it in your windrows or in your tree rows so you have that uh, melting snow in, in the spring. Squirrel damage. This is one that we're seeing more and more of around town. It's just Unbelievable how many calls we go on. I was recently on a call. This woman had a nice uh, elm tree in her backyard and she thought she had uh, some kind of insect or disease and it ended up just being squirrel damage. Um, she, she was feeding squirrels and the squirrels, you know, when they weren't being fed by her, they were chewing up her tree waiting for her to come out and feed them, I guess. But they just totally stripped her entire tree. And that's, that's unfortunate. You know, we're getting kind of an overpopulation of squirrels due to the feeding that is occurring in our community. And so we're going to try to address this issue this spring with a kind of a public education campaign. But um, <laughs> Get, it's tough because people love these little devils. You know, if you go to Holiday Park, they are so... Um, aggressive now. They walk right up to you. I had one run up the back of my leg the other day as I was walking around Holiday Park and um, they've just been um, so used to interaction with, with humans. They're, they're getting overly aggressive. And um, in the wintertime when they're not being fed, when people don't want to come out in the cold and feed them, you know, they're, they're, um, feeding on our young trees. We've had to do a lot of removals in Holiday Park. And what we're finding is that in the top of these trees, most of the branches have been girdled by, by squirrels. And so they're hastening the demise, unfortunately, of, of a lot of our older canopy in some of these parks, which is just too bad. So if you've got squirrel problems, um, I don't know what to tell you. Don't relocate them to the parks, though. We've been <laughs> seeing that as well. People trap them and then uh, put them in the parks. So don't do that, please. Yeah. I thought I thought there was a fine associated with releasing squirrels in the park. I you know I am not aware of one. You know we don't have an ordinance against feeding them, which is unfortunate. We have one. Um, towards feeding waterfowl, you know, it's, uh, 
it's uh, against a lot of feed waterfowl, such as ducks and geese, but it's not for squirrels. So yeah, it's something we've been considering is pursuing an ordinance or, um, I don't know, I, I think we're going to just try a public educational uh, campaign. Uh, make hats. Oh, that's, I don't think the public would like that. There are some real squirrel lovers out there that I wouldn't want to upset. So I don't think uh, harvesting them or uh, killing them is, is probably an option. Unfortunately, we don't have, you know, in uh, Lions Park, we used to have a pretty healthy population of foxes, and uh, I guess they had a disease recently that wiped them out. We just don't see the foxes in, in uh, Lions Park like we used to, so, and it doesn't seem like any uh, other predators really keep them in check, so. Okay, well, I'm a little, a little early, but... That gives us time for any questions. You know, that was pretty fast. I hit on a lot of stuff. I didn't get in a lot of great detail in anything. So if you have questions on anything, um, put it in the chat and I can answer them. Otherwise, um, Catherine and I will try to pick a date in the spring when we can get out on the college and do some pruning. And um, I bet I could talk... Uh, Rick Evelo into letting us plant a few trees too, so we could demonstrate some tree planting techniques and let everybody kind of take their, um, try their hand in some tree planting. Doesn't look like I'm getting many questions here, so. I'll put in one more plug for uh, Rooted in Cheyenne. Um, as I mentioned, we've got two planting events this spring. If you'd like to come out and plant with us, we could sure use the help. Um, we've got a website, rootedinchayenne.com. You can volunteer on the website, or you could just give us a call. Um, also, if you're interested in a tree through Rooted in Cheyenne, uh, March 1st, you can apply for a tree on our website. So I encourage you to do so. We've got a lot of trees ordered that we need to plant. So okay. Well, do you have anything else, Catherine? Do you got to make some announcements or anything? Catherine's left the building. <laughs> if you live in the county, um, we don't have, uh, we don't do tree planting in the county as of yet. However, this summer, we're going to have a bunch of pop-up tree giveaways, and those are going to be for anybody, and these are going to be five and seven gallon trees. We're probably going to do 10 or so per pop-up, so um, keep an eye out for that. We're going to be promoting that on Facebook, so you might be able to get a free tree that way. Thanks for all the uh, compliments. Appreciate it. Happy to do it. All right, I got a question here on Russian olive. Do you recommend Russian olive trees be removed? Oh, you know, that's a tough one. You know, in riparian areas where they're out competing native vegetation, I definitely recommend that they be removed. But if you have one that's in your yard that somebody planted and it's healthy, you know, although it's producing seeds and those seeds are likely getting into riparian areas, um, you know, and creating an issue. I I don't know. I don't think I would remove them if it were on my property, you know, just because it's so hard to grow trees here, but it's a tough call, you know.
Facebook page is uh, rooted in Cheyenne. Yeah, we do have a lot of educational content on our Facebook page for Rooted. Um, and then we're also promoting a lot of our events. Oh, we're going to have um, some homeowner workshops. Um, I mentioned the tree steward program, pop-up uh, tree giveaways. We're going to have a couple planting events. Also going to try to do some more outreach to volunteers. Um, so we're going to have some events at some local breweries, some local coffee shops. So. If you're interested, um, just follow us on Facebook. Ah, <laughs> Catherine, lost the Zoom connection. Okay. Well, I guess I will say good night to everybody then, and uh, stay warm. Make sure you, those pipes don't freeze tonight. It's going to get cold. <laughs>